Hey, welcome to Thoughtsy's Interviews, the show where we seize the thoughts of our guests while playing games of Magic the Gathering. I'm Lucas Frank. With me, as always, is my co-host, Zachary Cole-Smith. And today, we're joined by Jack Tatum of Wild Nothing. Jack, welcome to the show. What's up, guys? Hey, Jack. Well, Jack, are you familiar with Magic at all? I am. I'm actually um, quite familiar with Magic. I used to I, play quite a bit. I think I did, did the first time I met you was was that at Next Gen Games in Koreatown? I think might, you came it with might, Cole. It might have been. If if it wasn't then, then it was shortly before or after. Yeah, yeah, because that's the kind of first time that I remember us hanging out in a magic capacity. <laughs> right, <laughs> defining right. moment of all of our lives. I'd say it, it was. Yeah, it was kind of one of you know top five moments of my whole life. Honestly, you didn't enjoy yourself that that evening, if I remember correctly. You you I got, you got... I got rocked. I mean, it, so <laughs> it was the first time I'd ever gone to play, um, like at a store. Yep. I I I had always been and continue to be a very casual gamer. Uh, even even though at one point, well, it was really when I was living in LA, I I got deeper into it, and I think it was just because I had people around. Like occasionally, Cole and I would would play, and I had um another group of friends that I played with a lot. So I I kind of like dug into it quite a bit deeper than I ever had before. But and even it- still, it was. It was always casual. <laughs> it's kind of an intimidating experience going to those stores the the first time. It was for me. I mean, we uh, wound up at the losers table like instantly. And we <laughs> we did. We had to play against each other for last place, and we were like, "This sucks. Let's just go." I know it was a bummer, and it was especially a bummer for Cole because I think I beat you, and that was my only <laughs> win of the night. <laughs> yeah, I know it sucked too because I like I brought my A game, you know, but it just wasn't enough and Ugh. that's why you know sometimes life kicks you when you're down and you just <laughs> gotta give up on your dreams so so that's like, what happened related to that to that day you know so when we have guests on the show we usually you know we'll build a deck for that person like specifically it'll be like based on their song titles or something you know for phoebe yeah. we had a we played funeral charm which is a song called funeral you know stuff like that but uh and like oddly enough for you there are a ton of different directions we could have gone you know there's you have a song called shadow we could have gone with like a death shadow kind of yeah. uh deck you know there's paradise there's like the iconic card birds of paradise um and you have something that i think both lucas and i are extremely jealous of you have not one but two songs that are titles of magic the gathering cards you have incredibly, sick, right? incredibly cool move on your part. <laughs> it's wild. I've, I'm, I, yeah, we're both, we're both extremely jealous. So there's mm-hmm. uh, sleight of hand off mm-hmm. of, um, off of uh, that's on Life of Pause. Uh, no, that was actually on the last EP that I did called La- Laughing Gas. On yeah. Laughing Gas, and then yep. there's, uh, there's um, Wheel of Misfortune. Oh, is that a magic card? It's a magic well, card. Well. There's Wheel of Fortune. No, there's Wheel of Misfortune. Let's let's uh Is there really? Yeah, let's see this. I thought there was just Wheel of Fortune. That's that's what they want you to think. Let's see what we got. <laughs> Not that it was like a particularly clever pun to begin with, but I'm I'm a bit blown away that this is also a magic card. Um about right, to, we're well, about to confirm. I don't know how to find it right now, but uh Oh, that's convenient. Can, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. I don't know you if you can, can... search. You can search it right there, right? All right. Let's oh, see. there it is. Here okay. It is. It's Wheel, real. Wheel it's of real. Misfortune. Damn. Sorry. Um, if I had the card, I'd throw it in the deck because it works. But it actually sounds like a really cool card. Each player secretly chooses a number zero or greater. Then all players reveal those numbers at the same time and determine the highest and lowest numbers revealed this way. Wheel of Misfortune deals damage equal to the highest number. To each player chose that number, and each player who cho- didn't choose the lowest number discards their hand and draws seven cards. It sounds crazy. Anyway. That is, yeah. <laughs> so wait, I mean, is there like a name for these kinds of cards where they they get super wacky, you know, and you have to like, you know, like this one, for instance, makes you pick a number in your head and blah, blah, blah. Or there's like ones that make you like have to get up and dance around like a chicken or some <laughs> bullshit. 
<laughs> yeah, like maybe just like janky. Just like yeah, like, okay, totally. <laughs> That's yeah. Fair so enough. anyway, you know, those are all directions that we could have gone with this deck, but you know, like you said, uh, you and I used to play a bunch of Magic together, um, and yeah. your your deck was just classic affinity. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'm yeah, one of them was. Yeah, and I'm sorry to inform you, but your deck is dead. Uh, you know, as yeah. as the modern format grew faster and faster, it was clear that a lot of the like fast mana cards were fostering this really bad play environment. So yeah. Mox Opal was banned. So it goes. Um, but we've put together a slightly playable version of Affinity here. I think you'll recognize a bunch of these cards. And uh, oh. let's jump into some games. Yeah, I'm excited to see it in action. It's been uh, been quite a while for me. I actually, so, just you know, when you, when you asked me, Cole, if I wanted to be on this, I I busted out my my cards. I've got like this little cigar box where I keep like my uh, my memorable cards or whatever. <laughs> have you been playing in quarantine at all? No, because I don't. I don't really have any friends in Virginia that play. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, I just don't really have the time. Period. Yeah. But yeah, I wish. Fair enough. Um, we always ask our guests about just any amount of sci-fi, fantasy, gaming crossover in their world, in their lives. And we have some gaming questions later on, too. But yeah, I noticed there's the strong nod to Stanislaw Lem's sci-fi masterpiece, Solaris, on Nocturne. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we've... You know, connected at the L.A. Uh, Magic the Gathering store, you had a stint playing uh, steampunk Munchkin while, uh, <laughs> while on tour with a uh, friend of the show, Colin Caulfield. Um, can you talk about your relationship with the world of sci-fi, fantasy, gaming, where it's at, where it's been at? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I've always been a, a fan of of sci-fi more so than fantasy. Um as far as like the gaming element comes into play, I, I really didn't um, know much of anything about magic at all until I was living. So I lived in Georgia for a bit. I lived in Savannah f- for about a year right after I finished school. And yeah, I had some friends that played magic. And so that that kind of got me hooked. And it was it was but magic, I feel like is so deceptive because really at the end of the day it's it's just like kind of a uh, an, an intense strategy game and i never i never really got hooked like on the fantasy front i mean i like the illustrations and stuff and i think it's funny but that was never really the thing that grabbed me about it weirdly um but yeah you know always been like a sci-fi buff particularly you know sci-fi film um and like gaming, I don't know. Um, that's funny about the steampunk munchkin. Did did Colin <laughs> tell you about that when he was on the show? I yeah, we we do our research. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was just so okay. Well, first of all, we were on tour with Kings of Leon, who you never met. We literally didn't meet them <laughs> once. <laughs> yeah. There was one time when we accidentally passed them in the hallway, and we like weren't supposed to because the security guards always kept us at a distance. <laughs> and uh and like only one guy kind of gave like a half wave it was so despicable That's sick. but whatever <laughs> it doesn't matter that much but that was just so funny because we were we were playing actual arenas but then in the back room it was just like six dudes playing steampunk munchkin <laughs> top of like the world. that the the <laughs> lamest thing you could possibly be doing like yeah that's that's what arena rock bands do so sick yeah uh, <laughs> yeah cole and i were like that on tour just like playing magic in every possible green room yeah magic uh, is such a great tour activity like just downtime activity mm-hmm. i was able to get a couple of of my bandmates into it but it's not for everyone I just discovered Solaris and was blown away by that book. Um, mm. And um, talk about w- the impetus behind making that song, where it seems like you're kind of taking on the perspective of Kelvin, the main character. Yeah. Well, you know, I haven't actually read the novel, so I was more inspired by by like the original film version. Oh, wow. Um, but 
but I actually I liked the, the, the characters. Yeah, yeah, the Tarkovsky version. But I liked the character's name in the book better, uh, Rhea, so that's why I used it. Uh, but yeah, it's exactly that. It's 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 like um, I I very rarely write songs from the perspective of other people or f- of imaginary characters because I don't really consider myself much of like a storyteller type mm. songwriter. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I feel like that that's kind of part of it. I feel like someone like Kate Bush or something was constantly writing songs from the perspective of other people or, or you know, uh, fictional characters or whatever. Anyway, so I, yeah, that was just kind of like an early attempt of me giving that a shot. And I just thought it was, you know, just to, to keep it brief, like a very sort of uh, moving scenario of, of mm-hmm. just this this person processing the the death of their loved one and and having to sort of revisit that relationship yeah yeah i think it's so interesting in the context of you and your music where you're at now and kind of you know reissuing gemini and um the um not that that's where you're at right this second but you know more recently um, and like the idea of this character from his past manifesting into his world, you know, and these mm-hmm. sort of, um, I think that's, um, uh, somehow some, I'm having a hard time connecting those dots, but somehow it relates to you and my brain. Um, hmm. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you've talked a lot about, um, how, you don't necessarily identify as, you know, a narrative driven songwriter, but you, you have mentioned, I'm going to quote you here. It really is about world building for me. Each record looks different because it attempts to accomplish something different. Um, and world building is a term that comes up a lot on this show. It's prevalent in the, you know, fantasy, sci-fi fantasy community, gaming community. Can you define in your work what constitutes a through line, how Wild Nothing World makes itself known to you and and what you do to explore it? Yeah, I mean, I feel like when I when I said that and when I've talked about it in the past, it's it's I think it's something that 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 uh, most musicians will do, you know, especially musicians that that still have an interest in um the sort of record you know the, the the sort of classic definition of what a record is um which you know i i i was always such a like a like a purist about records for so long and i feel like only recently i'm starting to be like i'm just like an old fucking man about stuff these days like i don't want to be that way <laughs> so i i feel like i'm like loosening my grip on that a bit but but yeah for me it's always been you know when i when i go into making a new record like like it, it does have to be consistent to me you know i can't i can't there's no just like throwing songs together for me i feel like i ha- and that's what i mean by world building is this kind of creating this sort of start to finish zone and it's more like mood based almost than than narrative can you talk more about what you mean by you don't want to feel like an old man uh, (laughs) cole can relate to this for sure oh yeah well yeah you know i'm like in what context there's so many contexts in which i could in the context that you were just discussing, like yeah. you don't, you don't, you don't want to feel when you're making a record, you don't want to be, I don't know. You said you don't want to feel like an old man, or you don't want to. Um... Well, I just, it's not even an old man. I just, I feel like, um, I feel like a lot of things that used to be sort of very normal about the way that like I viewed the experience of listening to records is just sort of like turn into this like boring raucous like Mm. mentality where i don't know just i don't don't really care anymore like how people choose to release music if it's like if people choose to just like do songs at a time and put it up for streaming only or whatever they want to do just like 
I don't know. I don't really care anymore. Like whatever, as long as the music's good, I I like don't care. And you know, I think there'll always be a place for, um, you know, the record or whatever. Sure. But, but you know, that doesn't mean that it's like something that should be forced on everyone as like a format. You're not a purist about that side of things. Not so much anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Um. So speaking of world building, I heard that you're currently obsessed with Animal Crossing and have a really cool island. Um, I am, yeah. My experience with Animal Crossing is like almost one of of ASMR, where like even though you're a worker basically harvesting land for a landlord who keeps you in like this locked in this constant debt cycle, <laughs> ultimately like there's no negative consequences for failing to pay the debt, and the experience is like over, you know like overall really pleasant like what what would you say draws you to the game well it's funny because i i got it right after it came out a year ago which also just happened to coincide with me having a baby um so it was kind of cool at first you know there were there was like those first couple months of having a baby like extremely intense but there's also you know, all these weird pockets of, of downtime. And like, I was staying up half the night all the time just because, you know, my wife and I were kind of taking turns staying up at night. Um, cause he was waking up just all the time. And I, I kind of just got into this habit of playing animal crossing, um, to just fill the time. But I really, I wasn't so into it at first. Yeah, because I, f- I felt way more the way that you described it where I was like, this is whack. Like, I'm just, I'm just fucking like walking around, like breaking rocks and stuff. Like, this is so boring. <laughs> and, and that's really kind of how I felt about it for a long time. And I, I just stopped playing like full stop for months. And then actually Dustin, um, our buddy Dustin from Beach Fossils, he like recently got a Switch and started playing and i was like oh yeah like maybe i should start playing again and then it was really once i like figured out the whole sort of like customization thing of like customizing items and and just like getting into the terraforming i was like oh yeah this is the shit because then it's like like my ocd kicked in and it got like super fun because i could just spend hours sculpting my island you know (laughs) and everything is like super symmetrical and just like so over the top (laughs) sounds like you'd be into minecraft yeah maybe so i've never played minecraft my nephew is obsessed with (laughs) minecraft there's similar it's just like minecraft is more just like fills that like that like fantasy of just like walking into the woods and like leaving society forever where like Animal Crossing, you're still a part of society. Like, if you take too long away from playing, all your neighbors are like, where the fuck were you? Yeah, like, see, that's the other thing is that, done. like, even in Animal Crossing, I'm, I'm like, super antisocial standoffish. Like, I never <laughs> want to talk to my neighbors. They just, like, annoy me and get in my way. <laughs> I'm just, like, out, like, at the top of my island, like, doing my thing, and then someone will walk by and be like, hey, Jack, what's up? And I'm just like, uh Go do you away. feel that in real life? Or are you the same way in real life? Oh God, I hope not. But maybe in certain like scenarios, I don't know. You just moved. Yeah. Well, and yeah. Not just recently, but yeah, pretty recently. Yeah. Um, has it been hard, kind of meeting people during the? Yeah, yeah. You know, global pandemic's not the best time to make new friends. Right. And to move into a new city. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I so I I live in Richmond, Virginia now, which is it's just kind of like the hub of Virginia. So I have so many people that I've known throughout my life that have ended up here mm. um at like one point or another. So I actually do know I already know like a, a lot of people here and I don't know that I would have moved back here if I didn't. Um, you know, like, like my friend Jeff who plays bass in my band, he ended up moving back to Richmond around the same time that I did. And I had a bunch of friends I went to school with. So it's pretty like that doesn't bug me too much, but it's more, it's more just like trying to make friends as a new parent 
also mm. during a pandemic is super hard. Yeah. Um, and it's like, oh man, I really hate it because I I hate the idea that that I just play into this cliche or something. But it's like so hard to talk to other people about baby shit that don't have babies and it's also like you know that you're boring them to death so you don't even want to do it bore us to death what is the what's the (laughs) like what's the worst of it oh well man i don't know like what is it that you can't talk talk to people about just like the the constant grind of it the uh what what's the what's the biggest misconception I just I feel like it's like ev- everything that I thought about having a baby was just like a gross understatement. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so hard. I mean, it's yeah. awesome. It's you know, you always have to have that disclaimer like it's awesome. And I love my son. Obviously, he's like so sick and amazing. But um but yeah, it's like even even a year in, I just don't get enough sleep. I'm just mm-hmm. like tired and cranky all the time. That's the biggest thing, I think. You 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 know, like touring in itself is is really exhausting and and I feel like I I I was like, "Oh yeah, I can I can deal with this, you know, like I I you know, you know those tours where you're just completely sleep deprived for like 2 weeks straight and you're dealing um, with like six babies." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was, you know, I was like, okay, oh, I know oh, what that's like. That's intense. But no, it's not as intense as having a baby. I um, would, I, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, no. but whatever. Well, well, I had a pandemic related question. Should I do that one? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, I don't know. Like during the pandemic, you know, as I think we all know, musicians have basically completely lost the ability to work so some of us have resorted to to desperate measures you know some musicians are even hosting magic the gathering themed talk shows on twitch (laughs) or starting podcasts but can you talk about what keeping to such lows it's it's (laughs) embarrassing honestly but can can you talk about what made you want to host your live radio hour yeah i think i think it was kind of that was born out of a, a similar place that i imagine you guys are at where you're kind of thinking to yourself okay well what can i do to still you know try and remain active on some level publicly because you know i I have been working on a lot of music and and i have a studio set up in my house and you know i juggle that with being a father but i still have a decent amount of time to work on things but that's just like on my own behind the scenes or whatever so i when the pandemic first started, I wanted to have some way to still interact with my fans. And I'm, and I'm not, I'm really bad at social media, you know, like I, I'll post on Instagram like once every two months or something. And my Twitter's a joke. Um, <laughs> so th- that seemed like more my speed, um, to, to kind of host this, this radio show on Twitch where I could just like play music that I love, which I would be doing anyway at my house. And then I can, you know, chat with them and take questions and that kind of thing. So yeah, I did that for kind of a while. It was, I think I started it like a year ago in March or something. And then I did it through the fall. Um, but I just had to stop at a certain point cause I was, I was doing it weekly and it was just, it kind of got intense at a certain point. I just, I couldn't keep up with it, but I've been thinking about bringing it back because it was, it was really fun. I think you should. Yeah. Um, You said uh, to quote you again, from a career standpoint, it's a crowded world. I feel you have to fight to let your music breathe sometimes. And I'm a hesitant salesman. Uh, You mentioned in an interview about the aesthetics of anonymity in the early 2010s. And it's your relation to music. Mm -hmm. Um, But today, uh, I feel like no other generation of music, uh, musicians or artists in general, for that matter, has had to self-promote in the same way this generation has. And, And I find it's often misconstrued as narcissistic when an artist posts about themselves constantly when in reality there's all sorts of pressure coming from all angles to be 
self-promoting at all times. Um, yeah. Have you found a way to navigate through this? And can you en- envision any alternative in which the artist isn't beholden to self-promotion or engaging in social media? I don't know. I mean, I think... I think for me... What I feel like I could see working the best moving forward is 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 just finding more ways to 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 cut out the middleman and and have this sort of direct line to the people that care about what you're doing. And you know, I um, I don't really know anything about like Patreon or how Patreon works, but um just kind of like from what i know of it i yeah i feel like some some more ways to kind of just have that direct line you know what i mean and and social media is that to an extent but i feel like like you said there's always this this pressure to do this that or the other thing and i feel like for myself for so long i was always like oh just music first you know like i i like making music that's all i really care to do I don't really like putting myself forward too much. I don't like having this, you know, social media is, is like a job in itself. I think for the people that that are really active and good at it. And I think it's undoubtedly an amazing tool and kind of the best tool that a lot of people have. But if you're someone that doesn't really like vibe or gel with that, then it can be kind of hard. Um, yeah, I don't know too. Like maybe it's a generational thing. It's you know, it it is weird still having some of those memories of of like making music before this was really even a thing, you know? Like I can I can remember when we didn't have a Twitter and we didn't have an Instagram and like the only way you could find about out about like wild nothing shit was like on MySpace or our Facebook page or something, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's just weird. Um but that was a long time ago so i just you, gotta yeah you said that you have regrets about not putting yourself forward more or being being the face of the project mm-hmm. but it seems like that doesn't necessarily come naturally to you or isn't your first inclination necessarily yeah it's not but i also think you know a lot of that comes out of insecurity or something and and i think the older I've got, the less insecure I feel about the idea of like owning or like ownership of, of your music or your image or whatever. Um, and I wish that I had some of that when I was younger. I think, I think like, you know, early on in, in, in the early days of wild, nothing. Well, I think there was like two things. I think there was the fact that, yeah, like I was pretty uncomfortable with it and it was like this very new thing to me. But also that was just like, and I feel like I've talked about this too, is that like it really didn't used to be cool to to like put yourself in the spotlight like that. You know what I mean? Right. Like every everyone chose like fake band names for a reason. It's it it was like if if you kind of like shown a spotlight on yourself and was like, hey, look at me, everyone like all your peers would be like, like fuck off. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's that's gradually changed and i think in a lot of ways that's good because it was just sort of like this silly time in music kind of um but i do think though there will always be something kind of cool about like anonymity and, and mystery and music and um you know sometimes i wish like i didn't know as much about like the people whose music I like not because they're bad people or anything. It's just, I don't know. I like, I'm content with just like listening to records kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I I feel the same way. Yeah. Um, Cole, you gotta, no, it's your, uh, did we not, did we skip that one? No. Okay. Um, Uh, so, I guess I wanted to just ask about like basically like, you know, as a musician, 
we're, we exist in this industry that like thrives on this constant flow of new blood and it can just like turn on anyone at any moment um and it's like being a musician takes over our our formative years you know so it leaves us with like yeah. very little in the way of work related skills or education um and you know also it's one where career longevity is this like incredible rarity um so i've thought myself a lot about like my what my escape plan would be you know post dive um but i feel like for you throughout your career you've been like honing these production skills and recently been producing tracks for other artists is this something you want to keep focusing on and is this is this your escape plan <laughs> yeah i mean i i i think i would be incredibly lucky if if it if it can be my escape plan um but that that is where i've always seen myself heading you know, I think I'll always write and record my own music in some capacity, even if, you know, five years down the line or something, while nothing doesn't exist, so to speak. I mean, I really don't know. Well, needless to say, like, I'll, I'll always make music. But but that being said, you know, I, I, I do want to start touring less. Um and and just working more in the studio and 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 helping other people i've i've released a lot of music you know and i'm i'm like i'm still relatively young but at a certain point it's like damn i don't you know i i want to like see other people's visions like come into focus like that that is exciting to me and it's more yeah. exciting to me now than it than it used to be it used to be so just like like narrow focus just like me doing shit alone all the time and yeah that just gets kind of boring and and not just boring but like hard after a while um you can only do so much just like being a person in a room by yourself yeah totally do you want to talk a little bit about your recent production experiences yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, there's been a couple fun ones that that have come out this year that I've been super excited about. So, like, I worked a bit with Michelle from Japanese Breakfast. Um, we actually got... I was living in L.A. It was, yeah, it was when I was still living in L.A. And we got set up on, on this, like, writing session. Have, have either of you done writing sessions like this like through publishing companies or anything mm -mm. Mm -mm. yeah so it's it's weird i hadn't really done anything like that before but i just got set up doing all these different one day sessions some of it was with like cooler people that i was familiar with like michelle or whatever some of it was more pop oriented you did one uh, with mitski right yeah i did one with misky and yeah so like she helped me with a song that ended up on indigo like the last song on indigo called ben she helped write vocal melodies for her. um but i mean that part of it was cool because it was it was very much like this back and forth sort of like like you know i would go into a room with someone and we would both just like kind of pull up some stuff and then see what stuck uh or like what we might want to work on some of them were like incredibly awkward yeah <laughs> um i i have this <laughs> there was like this dude that i worked with who had worked with new kids on the block or something he was a, he was a nice guy and we we wrote this song together and i still have it on my itunes maybe i'll send it to you guys if it, um <laughs> it's it's pretty sick yeah because there's, <laughs> there's this initial phase of like you're each playing each other your demos and like trying to find something that sticks and yeah is it, were there moments where like neither of you liked either of the things that you were hearing just kind of yeah for sure and then that, and then that's weird because you know you've already like committed to right. this <laughs> this session and you've you know like driven a fucking hour to sure you know get to uh west hollywood or whatever right um and then you're kind of just like well i'll just i'll just fucking roll with this and then you know wait till the clock gets four so i can just be like yeah i gotta go um but anyway, 
the the one that I did with Michelle was super fun and we didn't neither of us really had anything so we just started something from scratch which almost never works like that's I feel like that's typically such a recipe for disaster to just go into a room with someone cold and be like let's write a song because sure. it's super hard to write songs and like how the hell are you supposed to just write a song from scratch like in a day yeah. with someone you've never met before but anyway we did and um and yeah and then a lot of time passed. She finally was like, got back to working on her record. And I went up to Philly, helped her kind of finish that song that we had started in LA. And then she sent me another song that she had a demo for. And I ended up producing that one. Um, but yeah, it was super, it was like very natural and casual with her, which I feel like was, it was a nice way to get into it because, you know, I don't know, just like the, the whole like world of production and, engineering and mixing it it can it can feel like really kind of like daunting and scary working with new people and and so often you know you might not end up being happy with the way things are going or something and and then it just becomes i don't know i mean i'm, I'm assuming that, that that maybe you all have sort of dealt with that a little bit yeah for sure yeah so it's, it's not when it goes well it's like ah uh, it's a relief, you know? Yeah. Um, should we do the segment? You want to do the segment? Absolutely. First segment. All right. So, so Jack, if you've watched the show before, you know, we have the, the segment uh, Magic the Gathering Card or Song. Yeah. Um, so, for you, we prepared something special. Um, so, you first appeared for a lot of your fans through a cover of Kate Bush's Cloud Busting. Yes. So we've prepared a segment for you, uh, Kate Bush song or Magic the Gathering card. Cool. This should be pretty easy for me, actually. <laughs> All right, we'll see. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I don't, you know. We do, like, it is kind of a mean segment. We do kind of try and trick our yeah. guests. Okay, good. Yeah, um, trick me. All right. <laughs> Number one, Waking the Witch. It's a Kate Bush song. Yep, off Hounds of Love. Yep. Uh, we've got Fog. Have you heard that song, by the way? I don't know. Probably. Oh, you should listen to it. It's. it's I've listened wild. to that whole album, but I can't. I can't picture that song. Same. Yeah, there's like this part where, oh, she does like so much like theatrical stuff where like all of a sudden some dude with like a super deep voice will come in and be like rah, 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 and make like donkey <laughs> noises and stuff. It's wild. Damn. Um. All, all right, right. Sorry. Pull, pull it up. <laughs> Number two, Cloud Blazer. Uh, that's a Magic the Gathering card. Magic the Gathering. Yeah. Suspended in Gaffa. That's a Kate Bush song. <laughs> Kate Bush off the Dreaming. Uh, yeah. Ancestral Vision. Mmm. That's the first toss-up for me. Nice. I'm going to say Magic card, though. It's Magic. Yeah, it's a, from like Alpha Set. It's like one of the oldest, oldest ones. Um... King of the Mountain. Mm. That's another one that I don't know. King of the Mountain. Ancestral Vision is not from Alpha, Cole. That's Ancestral Recall. Oh, just, yeah. Just Inse for, for any of the deep heads. In, in gotcha. <laughs> so, so embarrassing. Now I know how our guests yeah, feel. Deeply embarrassing. I feel like... I feel like King of the Mountain is too like nondescript to be a magic card. So I'm going to say it's a Kate Bush song. Kate Bush song, right. 2005. Yeah. Um, Lyra, Lyra Dawnbringer. I feel like that is a magic card. That is a magic card, not to be confused with the Kate Bush song, Lyra. Yeah. Um, all right, last one for the first half of the segment. Uh, Night of the Swallow. I'm going to say that's a Kate Bush song. Kate Bush, perfect Woo! score so far. I've had Waking of the Witch oh, yeah. playing in my headphones this whole time, and it's Have pretty you? It's pretty crazy. It starts with someone just saying, wake up really close Yeah. in your headphones. Yeah, there's some like really wild tremolo vocal action in there too i don't know if you've gotten there yet no i'm not there yet 
Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to listen after the show. Uh, yeah, the song song really opens up like midway through. That was excellent, Jack. You got 100% of the... Thanks. Um, I, am, I am like an actual IRL Kate Bush stan, so... Yeah, you mentioned her in like the first three minutes of this <laughs> I know. Yeah. I was so episode, glad about that. Which was, which yeah. <laughs> really cool. I feel like we picked the right person. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's a through line on this show where most of our guests come from a place where they're making music with very low expectations. Almost all of them have said at some point, I didn't expect anyone to hear it or I mostly just made it for myself or my friends. Um, have you maintained this mindset over the years and is it threatened by external or internal forces? I think... Um... Yeah, I mean, I think I think if I were to say that I like make music purely for myself these days, that that it would be a little bit of a lie. Sure, but um, I like want to unwrap that a bit because I don't want to sound like jaded or anything. Because music is my life, and I am obsessed with music and obsessed with making music, um, and would be making music like today even if there was never like a project of mine that took off or whatever but i think you know once you're in a place of of having released several records like i have and it is you know your your job so to speak like you can't help but but um consider external forces Mm -hmm. or, or factors rather um yeah, so it's it's weird. It's I think it's like a sad place to get to in some ways. You know, I, I think it's I have so much, um, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I, I have so many fond memories of like the early days of this band, um, you know, both like in my own experience of like making my first record for instance or just like the friends that i met along the way like early on like that was just such a cool time for me and it's it's hard to sort of like ever get that back those early days of of like making music and um yeah i mean i i i feel like that's the way it should be though right i mean that like you you talk to most people that like have found some success doing music and like you would hope that they all say like that they didn't expect it or that you know they 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 you know have always just done it because that's what they love to do Mm -hmm. i think like if you if you like start a band being like yeah like i expect people (laughs) to hear this (laughs) it's like yeah yeah you Um, you said in an interview that you that you still view yourself as more of a fan of music than a musician in in so many ways so, yeah. so like, how important is it for as a musician to remain a music fan first? Like, do you think there's a risk of getting too close to something you love, or like seeing behind the curtain in a way to like where you risk damaging your relationship with it? Yeah, I I think so. I mean, I think it works differently for everyone, and I think there's so many levels to it. You know, um, I feel like we we probably all have friends that that work in music that that like don't necessarily enjoy going home and like putting on a record and listening front to back or whatever um and that's a bummer you know like i i still listen to music every single day if i'm in my house doing some shit like i have music on um i think i think for me the thing that that is maybe the most annoying is just how analytical I can be listening to music now, as opposed to when I was younger. Um, just because I think once you do become involved in, in, in all the different, um, sort of phases of the creation of music, then you, you can't help, but, but listen to things differently and you can't help, but listen to it. Like from a songwriting perspective, Mm -hmm. uh, a production perspective, um you know all these different things it also can so, like, enhance your your listening to it you know I've, oh absolutely and then and then you find yourself looking for different things you know it's like it's like you're trying to find like something even more specific 
in terms of the sound of something than you might have been before. Um, I think where it gets annoying is where those things sort of get in the way of just like your pure enjoyment of something. Um, you know, like I feel like maybe high school me versus me in my thirties, like I probably would have been totally content, like listening to something that sounded like garbage just because I liked the song. Whereas now, like I kind of need more or something. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's a, a sort of a, um, a brief way of describing it, but so we were we were asked a question this week when Lucas and I were, were guests on this on this podcast called uh, Bad End, which I, I definitely recommend to our listeners who are interested in these kind of like big conversations around like gaming and culture in general. But it was about the role of music criticism in 2021. Um, it feels like mainstream music criticism at large has like evolved this desire to just have these like kind of definitive takes um about a certain piece of music to be like the final word um well i feel like a lot of the really great music journalists today like you know jan and liz pelly or, or larry fitzmaurice have shifted into this like much more personal newsletter format where the music they love is recommended to readers and digested and like meditated on and the role of music criticism to voice the opinion of like this music sucks uh has become completely obsolete um, mm. So your music has been beloved by critics, but do you read much music writing or like, what do you look for in music writing as a music fan? I I don't really, to be honest, un unless there's like something specific that somebody sends me, um, you know, if somebody like reads an article that they think is cool and they send it my way, then, then, then I'll read it. Um, but no, no, I'm not really have like a favorite website or publication that i go to for like music media <laughs> um i don't really know you know i um i i think uh, clearly and obviously there will always be a very important place for music criticism and mm -hmm. you know i i do think that 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 when the um, the vantage point of like a music writer becomes more macro, and you kind of like start seeing people write about things in in a way where it's it's uh, connecting interesting dots and sort of um, you know I I like that, but I you know I don't really read much of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's interesting. You, you should maybe send me some stuff that like recent stuff that, that you liked if if um, you have good examples of it. But yeah, yeah I, I think I think that 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 is an interesting thing and, and something that I've always felt about music, too. I mean, the I'm not saying that like someone shouldn't write about things that they don't like, but I've always felt like why? waste your time kind of like giving attention or time to things that you like don't enjoy or something i don't know yeah, i guess I'm, like what are the implications of that for the artist it's usually like these like new artists and they're just like we say this sucks and therefore like you know your your career is over because of like my yeah. opinion yeah and it's complicated too because i think you have so many people that that do sort of take things at face value and and um I think it's a little bit less like that these days. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what people read these days. Um, but I think, like, for our generation, You're everything was... Bible, I'll was... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you don't go to the Bible for your hot, like, music and culture takes? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, but, yeah, you know, our our generation, I feel like, was so pitchfork centric um and that i feel like is like a hard mentality to, to escape for people of like musicians of our generation um david foster wallace um says perfectionism is very dangerous if your if your fidelity to perfectionism is too high you never do anything because it means you sacrifice how gorgeous and perfect it is in your head for what it really is mm. um 
As a self-described perfectionist, does this feel like your version of perfectionism? Do you ever find yourself in a pl- in a, in you know a place of paralysis because of it? And is this part yeah. of the interest in in producing other artists as a sort of a step back? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I I think I I have a very complicated relationship with with my perfectionism. Because, yeah, it, it it can be extremely paralyzing, um, and creatively, it's it's often it's often worse for me than it is good for me. But I, what I will say about it is that being a perfectionist does keep me driven. You know, I think if I didn't have this this like ugly seed in my head that I could do better then maybe I wouldn't try as hard to do better. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you, I feel like, th- yeah, that's, that's like a, like a constant through line of my creative life recently is, is just how, how do I get to a place where I can just be okay with the things that I make and not have to. And part of it is, 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 you know, having like deadlines for yourself for example or just being like you know i'm i'm not i'm gonna like give this only so much time you know i don't i don't want to like work a song to death which which is a tendency of mine to to just like micro mix and produce a song until it like just doesn't even have a life anymore and and also too i think um I have a real issue with just finishing things in general. Like, like if I, if I, you know, open up logic or Ableton and I'm going to start working on a song and I spend an hour on something, um, if, if within like an hour, if I don't think it's going anywhere, I just like, it's trash. It's just like done out the window. And I sort of wish that I saw ideas through more, even if I feel like they're mediocre in the moment. Um, Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, I feel like so often in retrospect, you can find things that you like about them or or even just like the act of finishing something, even if you know that it's not something you're going to use. I think there's value in that. But I like am always so quick to just um, dump it, you know, Yeah, just the process of finishing, gaining something from being in the process instead of trying to find the value in the thing or. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely like um a process versus um product kind of battle mm-hmm. in my mind, you know. Um, yeah, I used Go on. Go I was going to I was going to change the subject. Oh, I just I had a I used to it's a little different from songwriting and and I think performance, but I I would obsess over being in the studio and I would do, you know, as a drummer, just dozens and dozens of takes. Cause I like, no, I can do better. Yeah. Um, and I had a, a teacher say to me, and it's such a trite saying or thing to say. It's so trite and obvious, but it was like, you're only as good as you are right now. Uh, like you can't outperform yourself just cause you will, will, will yourself to get better. You know, like you just have to accept how good you are right now and you can do dozens of takes but it's probably not going to be crazy better than the first you know yeah. the first few um and i find that the in songwriting i often try and like outgrow this i'm like no i i'm constantly faced with the like reality of where my songwriting's at you know and yeah. I, like yeah. having to some some amount of acceptance like no this is this is this is as good as i am right now um yeah yeah. And that's kind of constantly painful. Uh, very, <laughs> very relatable. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to say, Jack, I have a whole new level of respect for you. This deck is so fucking hard to play. <laughs> oh I know. Well, I, I have, I, you know, as you can imagine, have not been paying attention at all. That's tight. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's going good. Like what's, what's up in the. Right now we're, we've won, we won one match and we lost the other one. Um, or maybe we've played huh. three. I can't remember. Anyway, it's like we're doing okay, but it is hard. 
like math yeah. math shit um so yeah I wanna... yeah i remember what what's that one card that was sort of like the the like centerpiece of that deck it was like ravager Arc- Arc- yeah Arc- ravager, ravager. yeah yeah that one sometimes it would just be like you know like, <laughs> like counting <laughs> yeah yeah that's why i feel like you know like so i had i had that affinity deck that i would play and then i had that deck that was like pretty like it was the kind of deck that would be like i would lose if i went to like next gen or something but if i was just like playing my friends i would just like like beat them mercilessly right <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah th- those i mean both of those decks were like kind of fun but my favorite shit is just like super simple like whatever anyway um- so I wanted to ask you a little bit about the the like the captured tracks family and like yeah. the old the old days. So I I watched Wild Nothing play maybe your first New York City show at Monster Island Basement in like 2010. Cool. Uh, and like especially in that moment, I became very aware of this like family vibe at Captured Tracks and like this like kind of interwoven community of artists and like mutual support. Um, but looking back, how important was that for you as an artist? And like in general, how important do you think it is for artists and labels to foster the sense of community and, and solidarity? Yeah, I feel like when I when I look back on that time, that that wasn't even necessarily something that that I s- consciously sought out. Um, it, it was just sort of like kismet or something like. I got signed to Captured and sort of right out of the gate, I think there was this this feeling of like um, that, the, that the other artists on the label would be very accessible to me in terms of like chatting about shit and kind of getting to know one another. And I already knew Dustin um, because he at the time was 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 dating a friend that went to school that I went to school with. Um, so we kind of ended up getting signed around the same time, but it was total happen chance. And, um, yeah, yeah, it, it was, it was like that. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it, it was just like a very different time. I don't really know how, like what else to chalk it up to, except that they're, they're just like, really was a number of people making kind of similar music and we're all just part of this thing. And, and especially once I moved to New York, cause I wasn't in New York right out of the gate, you know, I, I signed to, to captured when I was still in Virginia. And then like the whole first year after Jim and I came out, I was living in Georgia actually just like going on tour and then coming back and like drinking Mountain Dew and playing magic. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, kind of on unrelated note about like you know artists making similar music all in the same scene so when i was making the first dive record i had just like discovered this world of captured tracks and was listening to a lot of gemini and it wasn't until we were on tour together like a year later that i realized i'd completely stolen a guitar lead line from your song gemini for our song uh, um human I, I think I know what you're talking about, actually. <laughs> or whatever. Anyway, yeah. um, have you ever subconsciously done that? Yeah. Sometimes not even subconsciously. <laughs> um, yeah, there's some there's some stuff. Um, I have a song on on a life of pause called Lady Blue, and I I sort of realized after the fact that the the lead line is very similar to um that song from Willy Wonka like um yeah. oh yeah 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 um it's not it's not like a full scale rip or anything but there's there's like something about it um yeah I like full scale rip I know, there there was a few things from that record actually um the song to know you like fully rips off this talk talk song which i i'm i was i'm familiar with the song because it's like their biggest song um it's just like one vocal melody where it's it's which song um it's my life yeah and i must have just done it by accident like 
it sucks. It doesn't that suck though? Like when you come up with something and you're like, yeah, this is cool, and then you're like getting towards the end of finishing a song and then you realize like, oh, I just totally stole this melody. That's why it sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, or like released it, you know? Like I, I did that with uh, um, Stranger Than... Oh, fuck, what's that birthday party song? Uh, doesn't matter. But like the first time I saw that band Girls play, yeah. at, uh, I don't remember where it was, but I saw, you know, I was talking to one of them after the show and I was like, oh yeah, that, that riff, that's the, the Sonic Youth uh, riff from Moat. And it was their song Morning Light and it's the exact same riff. And I was like, yeah, it's that, that riff. That's so cool. And they were like, what? Yeah. You know, they just also made the same one without having heard it. It happens. I mean, I, you know, this, this stuff just like, sleeps in your brain and then yeah there's only yeah. seven notes in the yeah. fucking scale like what are you gonna do it's gonna <laughs> happen eventually <laughs> to everyone um i'm gonna quote you for the last time here jack <laughs> okay. um i think a lot of people these days particularly in the world of music music criticism or I think for a lot of people these days in the world of music criticism, nostalgia in music is viewed as ornamental at best and irresponsible at worst. Um, can you talk more about this and what's the difference between nostalgia and as, as an aesthetic versus nostalgia as a way to, I don't know, reckon with our past? Yeah. Um, I, th- so when I said that, what what did I really mean by that? I guess I just meant that from the way that I see it, the the kind of music that that I make and that um, or not not so much anymore. I mean, I think there there'll always be this 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 sort of bittersweet undertone to my music because it's it's kind of this 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 feeling that comes very naturally to me and is like very sort of suited for my songwriting but but yeah this sort of like bittersweet almost nostalgic thing um but i i i think what i meant is that and it really has more to do i think with um the idea of kind of revisiting music from the past um and so not I don't I didn't necessarily mean nostalgic music in terms of like like lyrical content. I meant nostalgic music in terms of of you know like I m- I make like no um you know I have I have no reservations about like talking about the the kind of music that I like and like my music is heavily indebted to like various kinds of music from the 1980s mm-hmm. and like that'll always be I think the like my bread and butter so to speak but and and so i think when i when i said that that a lot of people view it as ornamental i i i just think you know so often in in the world of music criticism anything that's that's been done is sort of like gets instantly invalidated a lot of times and like i i think i i get that from a certain level you know like my my take on the situation has always been you know like i don't care if somebody's making music that's that's happened before as long as they're like doing it in a way that is like good and the songs are good like i don't really care but but i think also what i meant by like some people thinking it's irresponsible is that i i feel like for some people there might be this this feeling that than making anything that that isn't like expressly of the moment mm-hmm. is kind of bad because obviously there is so much you know happening like today here right now that is is like very ripe for for commentary um you know whether it's like social movements or um injustices or in anything you know and and i think i think for a lot of people like if that's not getting worked into your music then it's like you're being irresponsible and yeah i i i have mixed feelings about it you know i i I, but i i do think that it's 
Well, I don't know. It's just, it's just, I don't know really where I stand in terms of like, is it okay to just like make music because you like making music and, and because like, this is the kind of music that you like making, you know, which has like typically been the case for me in the past and, and like with the music that I've made. Yeah, I, I admire that about you. I mean, in everything where I'm in like official discussion, if I'm reading an interview with you, you you have this sort of like, yeah, I just kind of make my thing and people are going to take it or leave it. And I kind of, I like that about you as an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and we have this kind of running theme of nostalgia and our questions for some reason. Um, and I'm still trying to piece together how that relates to, to Rhea and Solaris, but it does. And I'm going to, mm. and I'm, I'm going to connect those dots. You're going to, you're going to bring that. I'm going to bring it full I'm, circle. I'm going to bring it full circle, like you. a Seinfeld episode. It's going to be <laughs> yeah. sick when I do it. Um, but I, I think of music as one of the most effective ways to create l- genuine little time capsules. Even if you, your aesthetic is, you know, an aesthetic from the eighties that you're using in, you know, 2012 or whatever, or 2021, you're, um, I still think it's a genuine time capsule of where you are in that moment. Um, and as we grow, there's that yeah. strange effect where the object inside the capsule hasn't changed, but we have changed so much around it that it's, that the object is almost unrecognizable at this point. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think, I think as much as, you know, like like my first record or like Cole, your first record or something, I think as much as maybe at the time there was like any number of sort of like reference points that, that either like we discussed or were discussed about us, like I feel like those have become semi-irrelevant when you look at those records now and it's like those records are very much of that particular moment. 100%. Um, which, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 context is key to like everything, you know, it's it, it it can it can change so much about the way that you like view something or whether or not you like something or I don't know. Yeah, does it change? Does it reveal anything about your current self today? Does 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 sort of uh, I don't want to say waxing nostalgia, but does looking back at your younger self, does that reveal anything to to does that? add to your context of who you are today at all or is it sort of like oh, i'm gonna kind of leave this behind me i th- I think so yeah it's you know i i i had mentioned this somewhere and something that i was talking about with with the the re-release of of gemini um of of just like how strange it is to have this very public document of who you are as a person Mm -hmm. that that like my records have left behind and i think probably more so for me you know like me specifically listening to my own records i'm i'm gonna sort of catch those nuances more than than someone else would obviously but um yeah it's weird it's 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 like having your your like I don't know. Could you say that it's like having someone you knew from your past come and visit you from uh, an alien sentient ocean? Uh, oh, possibly? he did it. You know what? You know what? I I could say that. In fact, I would say that. I, I, hey, I'm proud of both of you. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, like jack you just mentioned the the like the notes that you wrote for the the gemini reissue which i thought were 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 beautiful and you you said you. that like at 21 you were this like unnaturally nostalgic person that you would like feel yourself begin to miss things as they were happening like do you still do you find you're still like that especially now as a new parent like experiencing these precious moments that parents tend to cherish anyway I, yeah, I um, I think I have I have such a hard time like living in the moment for whatever that might mean to someone. <laughs> but I, 
I'm I'm just like a hella stressed out dude most of the time. So the the idea of like enjoying something in the moment, or <laughs> I should rephrase that because that, that sounds that sounds really bad. But no, no. What what I mean is um like appreciating like I don't know. I feel I feel like it's how do I dig myself out of this hole? I don't know. Um, I I know what you're trying to. I mean, you have a hard time yeah. staying present. You have a hard time being. Yeah, in the moment. yeah. It's it can be difficult for me, and you know, I think so often I I take things for granted or or sort of like, you know, I, I feel like I used to do that all the time, like on tour, you know, where where it it wouldn't be until months later where I was like, oh, that tour was really fun, and I like I really missed this shit, and like that night was was awesome, you know, like when we you know did this that or the other thing but usually when i'm living it i'm just like oh like so stressed out just like worrying about logistics and all this stuff um you guys toured together right Mm -hmm. we did yeah do you have any good do you have any good cole stories that you want to share with uh with our audience any good it was our first first tour i think ever too was it really i think so i don't remember that um yeah i mean god when was that tour was that in like i think that like 2011 yeah 2011 or 2012 or something um i don't know it was it was a slightly different time i feel like i feel like i don't remember us hanging out like that much on that tour really yeah i feel like we probably I uh, I remember you guys like sound checking at some venue and just being like, "This is so crazy," but um, yeah. I mean, I kind of don't remember anything. I'm sure we were just like late. Oh yeah, and we played those Alex G. The Alex G. I mean, I guess they weren't Alex G. shows because he was the first of three opening for both of us. But oh yeah, the um, I got the I got the poster right there. The uh, Wild Nothing Dive Alex G. shows. Was that at the Fonda? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway, <laughs> that was fun. Tight. Yeah, I feel like. Anyway, I feel like the uh, for the the tour we did together, we were probably just like really late to all the shows, and. You know. <laughs> I think yeah, I feel like you y'all like definitely like partied harder than us at the time, and I don't really really remember how much the of that have turned. <laughs> so trust me I've, i'm doing very little partying um so i guess lucas kind of kind of touched on this earlier um and you know just the last question speaking about about parenthood like how would you describe parenthood to someone who has yet to experience it um I f- I feel like it's it's kind of the scariest thing about it to me but the th- but the thing that like deep down I know is is the best thing that'll probably ever happen to me um is this just sort of like pure ego death of like like I am now it's it's like a like this very immediate feel. I mean, I, I like have this very visceral memory of, of driving home from the hospital and just being like, my life is never, ever going to be the same. And like, I have to, like, I just have to take care of this person, like no matter what now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's just like no, there's no room for just like being like Mr. Hot shit. You know what I mean? It's just like, you're just Mr. Clean up shit. <laughs> yeah. Clean well, up hot that. shit. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that. Um Yeah, so in that's in that sense it's like Yeah, it's just it it's there's no there's not much room f- Oh my god, I don't know. Talking about parenthood is like really complicated. Oh, I'm sure. And, and I I just feel like like any conversation that I ever had about parenthood before I became a parent, like now seems so 
when wrong. I think laugh, which is wrong. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like even uh, anybody, I feel, you know, I feel like when I talk to even my parents about parenthood, just like, you know, how do you know what to do? They're like, we didn't, you know, it's like, how do you know when you're ready? They're like, you never are. You know, there's just like, yeah. you kind of just assume that your parents had it figured out and that's why you exist. But it's just like, it's never like that. Yeah. I I think, I think like people our age just kind of come into this situation being like, like there's just going to be this moment where I know, or like there's going to be like a year where we just like, like everything lines up and like we got our shit in place and like we're ready to rock, like let's have a baby or something. But no, it's just, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's that way for some people, but yeah, it's, it's it's so much harder than like anyone ever could have told me it was going to be. <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, like, I don't know. There's 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 like honestly no way to talk about parenthood without just sounding like so trite. So it's, you know, I'm like hesitant to, to do it on this like public. Right. I mean, I feel <laughs> like, like says Twitch, a lot Twitch too. stream. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it's like, you know, I'll, I, it's, it's hard to imagine loving someone more than, than I love my son. And it's, it's like a a very different kind of love than anything I've experienced. I think because of like the responsibility involved. Um, but damn, it is fucking hard. (laughs) Someone said once, I can't remember who it was, that it's the, the, uh, I think, oh, I think it was David Foster Wallace again. I'm sorry to do it twice wow, in dude. one, in one, but he was, I think it was in the context of AA and all the like trite, uh, AA isms like works if you work it one day at a time, you know, um, yeah. but that sometimes the trite phrases are so eye rolling and, and, and boring because they're so obviously true. Um, yeah. and that they're, that they're, profound in a way because they're often hard to live by um but there's this there's this universality to them that's so true that everyone's like yeah of course you know Mm -hmm. so it it makes sense to me that the things that you would have to say about parenting are sort of universal uh and and maybe feel like we've all heard them a million times you know yeah yeah and i just i don't know like I th- I think too you 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 feel like there's these things that you like should be saying after you have a mm-hmm. kid or something or like or things that you feel like you should say to your friends after they have a kid. What do you um, feel like you should be saying and then what do you want to say? I just kind of like wish that someone like straight up would have been like no like your life is actually going to fucking suck for like a couple months. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> lots of people tell me that about having kids. Like lots okay. of the people around me who are having kids are like it's a fucking nightmare hellhole. You'll be miserable. Don't do it. Tell like you absolutely have to. It's it's the most hard shit you'll ever do in your life. Yeah, like, well then, <laughs> yeah, y- your your people are like doing doing you right, I guess. Not not to say, <laughs> say that like I just I just feel like it's like you got to know. Like you got to know going into this that like it's it's not like what you think it's gonna be or i don't know it's just i just feel like it's better to have those kinds of expectations because then it's like if you think it's gonna be the hardest shit you've ever done then like maybe like you know it won't be as bad for you or something i don't know it's like it's it's better to have like extreme expectations i feel like i yeah i think that part of the discussion is just as in part of uh, just as important as the part as the like oh it's magical it's incredible part of yeah because all that stuff is like so true and it that is right. like but it's i don't know i don't know uh my wife is in chat saying thanks now cole never will want to have kids at this rate <laughs> <laughs> which like you know i think that it, it's i think it's important to just like you know talk with your friends about the realities of things and like for the yeah. the moments where it's difficult like you also are experiencing like the most profound love and like connection to a human being that is possible and yeah. it's like you know like the defining experience of human life you know it's not yeah. like the the trade-off is you know there is no trade-off in my mind it's just like I, anyway danny don't worry about it we'll, we'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> no uh, no i know yeah donna's gonna kill me for saying all this stuff too but um <laughs> Yeah, 
I don't know. I, I feel like there's there's so much more like self reflection than I expected to. Um, and maybe part of that it has to do with having a baby during the pandemic, which I also do not recommend. Um, just because there's like there oh, is nothing nice. nothing but time to like just reflect on who you are and who you want to be. And like, it's, it's, I think it's hard for a lot of like musicians and musicians our age, like for some of the more obvious reasons being that, that just like touring while having a baby is going to be hard. Like I have not figured that out yet. Like that's going to be a whole another thing. But, um, but also I, I think like, we we like have defined so much about ourselves through like the thing that we do and like like being a musician i feel like was so integral and important to like my self-worth and like who i am as a person and so when some of these things get you know sort of like thrown into question for a number of reasons like parenthood pandemic blah 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 all this stuff is like on the back burner for the time being you're just sort of like who am i (laughs) Mm. i have have a note in here that says doom and gloom parenthood question um and i think what i was trying what we were trying to get at with that is i always have this thought when i think about having kids myself of like uh maybe this is too heavy i don't know we can you can you can veto this question but i have this 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 thought of like what am i supposed to tell my kids about all these like existential crises that we're facing as like that humanity faces about like um you know yeah. uh t- the climate crisis well i feel supremacy. like <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, we can veto this, though. And I, I already vetoed it before we started the stream. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you well, veto I won't, it? I, I, it's I won't, still I in here. Get, like, <laughs> I'll, I, I feel like I can actually sort of answer this question in, in a in a good way, though, because I think, you know, I because I know a lot of people that 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 are like this, where they're just like, oh, I, like, why, I don't want to have kids, like, like the, with the way the world is, mm-hmm. and like, first off. I mean, no one should ever like have kids if they don't want to have kids. It's like it's it's it's, um, but you know, I I feel like for me, like it's it's kind of forced my hand in terms of like I don't have a choice but to be positive. You know, like like I want to have a positive outlook on the world now, like for my child, and I want to like even against all odds like believe that there's a way that like the world can be better <laughs> you know um maybe that's naive but i don't know no i think that's a great I answer that's, and that's answer why too. i wanted to ask that excellent yeah. question that is that's the Despite, answer you were hoping for it is <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah yeah so optimism um mm-hmm. you found optimism You've changed. You're listening to a lot more dance music now. Yeah. Um, and um, how do I how do I put this into a question? Where, where are you finding Where are you finding optimism? I I know your hand is forced to just like I have to be optimistic. I ha- I have a kid. I have to have hope mm-hmm. for the future. Um, how does that? Are there ways? Um, in this sort of uh new frame of mind that you found to like to to mine for optimism in the world uh in around you does that make sense Is that yeah how are you finding optimism how do you <laughs> what, I mean, what are like, some practices i feel like part of it is is very simple and just like in in terms of of kind of the pure enjoyment that I get out of the things that I've, that I've always loved or, you know, like learning, learning to, to, to not take things that I do love for granted. And, you know, it's like as, as horrible as the world is, you, you there's, you know, 
I mean, like music even is 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 like incredibly therapeutic for mm-hmm. any number of reasons. And um, yeah, I I'm trying to think of like. And I don't know. I, I feel like for me too, it's 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 been a little bit about kind of like, um, like scaling down a lot of things in my in my life, and just like, like indulging in simpler pleasures, or or just like the idea of kind of um, enjoying like my smaller community or whatever, um, and. Yeah, like being in a place like Richmond, which is is not like a small place, but it but it's it's smaller than a lot of places I've lived, um, and I feel it's it's much easier to kind of get that sense of of community that that I've sometimes felt was harder to have, like in bigger places. Mm, that's a good answer. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. I guess we just got a couple more questions. One that I wanted to ask about was regarding fan favorite uh, Wild Nothing records. You know, I feel yeah. like when people say, you know, X record is my favorite favorite record, it tells me something about that person. So, like, you know, when, when people say, this is my favorite Wild Nothing record, A, what's what's the coolest answer to that question? And, and B, like you know, what does it say about a person who holds like each record as, as, as a favorite? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know that I would say that there's like a coolest answer. There's, there's not like an answer that excites me the most, um, necessarily, you know, I, I guess on, on like a very like purely selfish level, I do kind of like get stoked when someone likes my third record just because I like always had it in my head that people didn't like that record. So if someone does and I'm like, cool, it's just like a little slight pat on the back or something. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think like my second record Nocturne is, is sort of like hands down the, the fan fave like nine times out of 10. And yeah, I don't really know. I never know like why anything is like better liked than something else. You know what I mean? I don't. I'm like too. F- it's hard for me to like understand it. I don't know because I like I was make you know I made all these songs, so there was like very little difference in my mind between like the writing process of my second record and my fourth record. Mm-hmm. But but like to somebody else, it f- feels incredibly different or something. I don't really know. So if I give you my top three favorite Wild Nothing songs, can you tell me if if uh, if they would be the cool answers or the lame answers? Yeah, let's hear it. I noticed that none of them are on the live record, so I feel like they're all lame answers. But, but here we go. Here's my couple. my Wild Nothing tier list. Number <laughs> three. Excited. Number three, to know you. Cool. First time, first time I heard that song live, I panicked. Whoa, um, why? Because <laughs> it was so good. I oh, like, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, number two, ride. Mm-hmm. Really love that song. Kind and, of the same song. <laughs> yeah, like the yeah, totally the the yeah. like the one chord and then like the yeah, full yeah. step up. Um, number one, wild nothing song, ocean repeating. Hmm. That's a cool one. Such a good song. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so, actually, so am I, I cool? You're cool. I mean, you're. <laughs> yes. You've always been cool. There's, there's no. You don't. You don't Thank have you. to worry about that. But um, yeah, no. Um, this is such a coal question. It's it's just reeks of coal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the second EP I did is 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 still like one of my favorite things that I've done too. Um, mm-hmm. It's called Empty Estate. Um, yeah, it's I, f- I feel like that EP is really interesting, too, because I feel like that alone should should be like a testament to me. Um, just like totally fucking trashing my perfectionism, because 
that's like the only time that I've ever worked on something where I just like wrote all the songs and recorded it. And it was like only with, within like a span of two months or something. So whereas I, normally I spend like fucking three years working on shit. And um, it's one of your personal favorites. And it is. Yeah. And I don't know. That says something. I know. I'm just like, what am, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, all right. So speaking of what are you doing? Are you ready for 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 Kate, Kate Bush or uh, Magic the Gathering Part that's Two? That's what I'm doing. Yeah. All right. This is what we're doing. All right. Number one, on thin ice. Um, that's a Kate Bush song. Magic. Oh, yes, one. we got him. We got, got him. me. Uh, because not to be confused with under ice. Mm. Which is Kate mm-hmm. Bush. We see we, we that's we try sneaky. To trick, yeah, you're trying to, to trick, trick me. Here. Um, strange phenomena. Hmm. Well, it's definitely not a Kate Bush song that I know. If it's a Kate Bush song, so I guess I'm just gonna trust my gut and say that it's a Magic Card again. Kate Bush. It's the <sighs> last song off the Kick Inside. Oh uh, yeah. That's not one of my faves. Nice. Um, the Fog. Got him. That is a Kate Bush song. But it also is. maybe a Magic Card? I don't it know. It is. Nice. Double points. Yeah. It's wow. A, yeah, he gets wow. it. Wow. Damn. It's, you're the first person who's gotten a trick question one, like who's gotten both. It just like it felt right. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a classic. It, well, it was right. Yeah. Wow. Um, the Painter's Link. That sounds more magic to me. Whoo! That that one's that one's Kate Bush. Oh, it's off off Ariel, two thousand five. Right. Okay, that makes sense. But not to be confused with the Magic: The Gathering card, Painter's Servant. <sighs> I'm really botching this second segment here. You were hundred percent on the oh, last no. one. No, I was on fire, and I'm just on ice. <laughs> We've worn you what? down. I'm under uh, the ice. We got we got tails end. Tales End. Well, there is a Kate Bush song called Rocket's Tail. Tales End, though. Mm. Why do I feel like I'm going to get this wrong? I'm going to say Magic Card. Magic Card. Okay. Uh, all right. Misty Rainforest. Um, I think that is also a Magic Card. It's a Magic Card. Kate Bush has a song called misty yeah so that's a little trick there um invisible stalker i that is a magic card <laughs> it's a magic it's, card yeah i think I, you played it i, in I have it i think i have it yeah. yeah yeah uh okay experiment four that is a kate bush song that's kate bush magic card is experiment one Ooh. um and then this last one we have from chat Night of the Shallow. Hmm. Night of the Shallow. I'm going to go KB. KB. Excellent. Well done. Impressive. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, I'm I'm bummed I got a few wrong, but you know that's how it goes. Hey, that's life. Yeah. I think um, the secret is if you don't know, if you if you don't if you haven't heard the song, you should just say "magic card" and you'll probably get it right most of the time. Because people will be like, "That sounds like it could be a Kate Bush song, but it's just a magic card yeah. that sounds like but a Kate the, Bush yeah. song." <laughs> yeah, we like. But the thing is, is like she does have maybe two records that I just sort of like flat out don't listen to. So it's yeah. like there there is like a decent amount of material where I like just might not know. Um. Yeah. So, I guess I should describe this last segment. Lucas has a segment called "Care to Comment." Okay. So, so I reached out to to Dustin, um, Nardwar style, to get some dirt on you. Okay. Uh, which and then I asked Dustin if he would be on the show, and so then we have to ask you for dirt on Dustin. That's like the retribution. But he gave us a few a few facts, which we'd like you to confirm or deny. So, Lucas, you want to go okay. for it? You can confirm, deny, or comment any right. of these Care to things. Comment. Okay. Yeah. okay. 
All right. Got here it. we go. Here we go. You had a band called. This is a, we'll start off easy. You had a band called Face Paint in college. Yes, that's true. Okay. Would you do you care to comment or should we move on? I I can. It was None. sort. It was sort of. Uh, well, that band essentially only existed so that I could teach my friend Jeff how to play bass, because <laughs> he he like didn't know how to play an instrument at all, and then I like wanted to start a band, but I didn't have anyone to play bass, so I just I just taught him how to play bass so he could be in my band. It worked. And Jeff is really so, good. At bass. So now, so now he owes me everything, is what I'm saying. That's nice. fine. Yeah. Uh, you are super into Japanese city pop and Bowie. I mean, yes, okay. I am. All right. Care you were the be- care to comment? Nah. <laughs> okay. You were the best man in Dustin's wedding. I was. It was one of the great honors of my life. Um. Yeah, they had a ball and wedding. It was. It was fun. It was insane. Mac DeMarco. Yeah, Mac Mac's DeMarco was the- was the wedding band. Oh, that that is like one of my favorite wedding memories ever, actually. Because okay, so Mac and his band were the wedding band, and they did a cover of "Man in the Mirror" and yes. Michael Jackson. And you know, at the end of that song, there's like an epic key change, but they just kept playing, <laughs> kept and every going. time they played the chorus again, they would change the key <laughs> again, and just they changed it like ten times. It was crazy, and every time they did it, everyone was just like, "Whoa." <laughs> It was Damn. so fun. It was That's so fun. So sick. Yeah. Uh you are insanely good at Mario Kart. I would not say I'm insanely good. I'm good enough to beat Dustin basically every time, but <laughs> who's your character? <laughs> I play Yo- a blue Yoshi. Nice. Sick. Yeah. I mean, uh-huh. I've never beaten Dustin at Mario Kart, so I think that you're pretty good probably. Yeah. I just, you know, People get weird about video games. I'm not trying to like say I'm like Mr. Hotshot at Mario Kart, and then one day like a fan is going to challenge me, and I'm going to get rocked, and then my entire rep is going to be in flames. Totally. Okay, so better than Justin. <laughs> we, can, we can settle for better than Justin. Um, Who's confirm- Justin? I, oh, sorry, um, Dustin. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> I've never really met Dustin, so uh, you. <laughs> you clogged a toilet confirm or deny you clogged a toilet at the cmj music festival minutes before walking on stage <laughs> i did canos <laughs> yeah oh my god Ugh, dude that cmj was the worst <laughs> um yeah that was cmj is not a thing anymore correct i mean That's, i don't i don't it, I, know I don't yeah think they, i don't think they do it anymore yeah anyway um yeah, that was so that was like Jim and I time and we got invited to play a bunch of shows at CMJ, which, you know, at the time I didn't live in New York. I kind of like hated New York. I still do sort of, but whatever, that's a whole nother. <laughs> but um but yeah, just like driving like your shitty ass van into Manhattan and like having to play several shows like in one day and just like you can't park anywhere and you just get like a bajillion parking tickets and i was just like hella stressed out and we were playing this showcase um and just like out of nowhere i got like the worst stomach ache i was like oh fuck this sucks so like i went and (laughs) there was two bathrooms at pianos one of them was already out of order and the other one there was like this giant line so I wait in line, like my stomach is killing me. I get in, do my biz, and flush the toilet starts overflowing. <laughs> and I'm just like, you gotta be fucking joking me. And I just like stood in there for a few minutes, like just totally speechless. And at this point, there there was probably a line of like 15 people to get into this bathroom. So I think I just like put my hood up and just like charged out of the bathroom. And uh, and then I remember like walking around the corner and just hearing the next guy that went in just go like, whoa, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yep, fuck CMJ. <laughs> yeah. And then and then had to play a show like immediately. Dude, horrible. Um, uh, oh, you, you got are, one more. I got one more. 
you are shockingly good at singing really high 70s hard rock vocals. Confirm or deny? I can confirm. Damn, why don't you do that more? That seems. I don't like know. Yeah. You so, should. <laughs> so Cole can attest to this, but but the the Beach Fossils practice space. Um, <laughs> if you ever get invited to go there, it just like evolves heavily into like tomfoolery very quickly yeah um and yeah there was like there was it might have even been like a series of days because we got that into it but we sort of like invented this band called freight (laughs) and and we we like actually wrote maybe three songs the closest thing i can like compared to is like like wolf mother-esque like in yeah. the worst way yeah Zeppelin. Like in, yeah. yeah um yeah and we recorded we recorded a few of them just like on our iphones yeah i don't know i didn't know that i could do that and i just like i started just like trying to sing like like what what's that fucking band that sounds like um led zeppelin that oh um uh... Um, Greta Van Fleet. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, I, dude, like, yeah, I could be a fucking millionaire if I just like embrace this persona, but I can't. Yeah, I think you need to. Wait, what the fuck is going on in this magic? Is there a Magus of the Moon in our opponent's Tron deck? Yeah, and uh, they just turned on my red mana, so I can like kill this thing. Yeah, but there's why is there a Magus of the Moon in the Tron deck? I don't, I don't know. It's beautiful. I'm, yeah, that's crazy. They play Sorry. like, you know, they within their deck is the worst card. Yeah. Like their most hated yeah. card to encounter and they're just like, "Fuck it, I'm just going to play it myself." I respect that. Um Well, well just to speak on the on the Beach Fossils practice space thing, it is like, you know, if you ever get invited, I highly encourage you to go anybody because <laughs> it is like a one one of a kind experience. Like you don't know if you're going to walk in and like cover the same like 15 seconds of like a limp biscuit song for two hours and like go crazy or record an entire punk ep in like 40 minutes or like there's absolutely it's, it's no so predicting. true there, there was one time the the um we like started playing peg by steely dan but in the in the style of suicidal tendencies <laughs> and this just went on for like four hours it's just that's just the kind of space it is. Even the like shit father show when we played together, there was like we were had to cover like a blank dog song or something, and we turned it into a jam on Steely Dan's Peg. Yeah, <laughs> what's shit father? Uh, um, uh, do you want to take this one, Cole? <laughs> Basically, it was like Captured Tracks did a five year anniversary show where you know it was like just celebrating five years of capture tracks and so like as many bands as could play played but there was a bunch of bands that like couldn't play or didn't want to play you know there's blank dogs and and stuff like that um whoa holy shit this deck is so weird we just died so fast um (laughs) so for the bands that that couldn't play we like covered their song so it was me Dustin, Jack, Mac, and I think Matt and Callman. Matt, yeah, Matt, Matt Callman. And Justin played... from yeah. uh, Craft Spells came up for a couple songs. But basically, like, you know, we were just, we were like the house band. We we're like a cover band. Yeah. Tight. And there's like one video of it, I think, somewhere. Mm-hmm. Well, we've been talking for almost two hours. Um, so I figure we should yeah. wrap up. Yeah, for sure. Um, is there anything you'd like uh, to rip you'd like? <laughs> is there anything you'd like to to plug? Um, um, no, just yeah. Check out my band Freight, and <laughs> other than that, not a whole lot to say. Um, I'll I I will actually take this time to to plug being a parent. It's very nice. I like it, and I don't want anyone to think that I was being overly negative about it. I was being overly negative about it. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, awesome. Uh, yeah. But thank, thank you so thank much you. for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. 
Yeah, thank yeah. you, Jack, for coming and talking to us. Um, thanks, Lucas, thank and thanks to everybody who stuck around and, and uh, trolling us in chat. I really appreciate it. Deranged yeah. Strangler for our themes, theme song. Uh, legendary artist. Um, yeah. And uh, we'll catch you next week, uh, Monday at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, okay, yep, bye, everybody. Peace. <laughs>